Welcome to lecture 31, which is going to be on elastic and inelastic collisions. Now, in this lecture, we're going to go back to talk about collisions, um, the type of thing we dealt with previously using momentum conservation. In fact, momentum conservation, of course, still applies, like the laws of physics don't change just because we're moving on in the course. But in addition to momentum conservation, we can ask about kinetic energy conservation. And what's crucial to understand is that there is no guarantee that kinetic energy is conserved in a collision. It could be, in many collisions it is, or very close to, but it could also be that energy, kinetic energy is lost to thermal energy or sound if you hear a crash, right? There's energy dissipated in the sound, the sound waves, um, and so on. So this is the distinction between so-called elastic and inelastic collisions. It's whether or not kinetic energy conserved or whether it isn't. There's also a thing called a perfectly inelastic collision, collision which we come to as well. Um, so we'll talk about those. We'll look at some specific cases, um, namely we were hitting stationary targets of varying masses. And we are going to look at the, the situation in 2D. And specifically, we're going to make a, write a proof um, why it is that billiard balls tend to bounce off each other at 90 degrees, ultimately due to the collisions being very close to elastic. So let's get started with that. So here's the situation. Imagine there's a mass, some kind of lump of stuff of one mass, one kilogram, going 30 meters per second, and it's going to hit a different second mass. It's two kilogram. Right now, that's just sitting there, just to keep things simple. What happens? Well, we know momentum is conserved, right? That's crucial. Momentum is conserved. By momentum, we mean the total momentum. If you're feeling a bit shaky on the subject, you better go back and review that because we're going to need it. Momentum is conserved. But momentum being conserved still leaves us lots of options. So, for example, let's say option one is the two objects stick together. I have a two kilogram and then one kilogram, so three kilograms total. They stick together. And you can imagine this gets hit, they move together. Well, it's not a hard calculation. 1 times 30 is 3 times what? They'd be moving with 10 meters per second. Right? So that is something, oops, let's say option 1. That is something allowed by momentum conservation. Um, but maybe there, there are different options. Maybe there's option 2, where this mass, that blob, they don't stick together. This mass just comes to rest. It rests now. This one was at rest at first, and now the bigger mass, the two kilogram one, is moving off. How fast would that be moving? Well, one times thirty is zero momentum here, plus two, which is two kilograms. Two kilograms times what? Well, two times fifteen meters per second makes one times thirty. So momentum is conserved in this one too. Hmm. Are there other options? Yes, there are. For example, we could have, let's call it option three, that, that maybe this one doesn't come quite to rest. It just moves with a little bit of speed still. Maybe the one kilogram mass still moves forward and it goes maybe five meters per second. So not very fast. Well, then the, the two kilogram mass, how fast would that have to move? Um, well, let's see. One times five is five, but I want, I want one times 30 as my total momentum. So, to add 2 times what? 2 times 12.5 um, meters per second, right? So 2 kilograms times 12.5 meters per second, that's 25 plus 1 times 5, that's 30, equals 30. Momentum is conserved in this case too. And there are more options. Let's go with option 4. So maybe, maybe this one actually bounces back, right? So maybe this one is actually going backwards at, I don't know, say 10 meters per second. Is that possible? Well, if momentum is conserved, it's my one kilogram mass, then my two kilogram mass would have to go how fast? Well, let's think about it. This is one times 10, except it's backwards, so minus 10. But I want plus 30 for my momentum. So if I have 20 meters per second here, right, 20 times two is 40, 10 times mi minus 10 times one is minus 10, 40 minus 10 is 30, equals 1 times 30. So in all of those cases, momentum is conserved. And then 
I can write, etc., etc. Right, so there's an infinite number of cases. No matter what the speed of this one is, the velocity and direction, I can find a corresponding, corresponding one here. So what happens? Like which one actually happens? The answer it depends on what types of objects those are. But one thing we can investigate in each case is what happens to the kinetic energy. So let's do that. So let's see how much kinetic energy we have at the beginning. In this case here, we're going to have the kinetic energy is, well, one half times one kilogram times 30 meters per second squared, um, which in my books comes to 30 is squared is 900 times one is 900 times a half is 450 joules. Right, so that's the total kinetic energy at the beginning because this one doesn't have any because it's just sitting there. But how much kinetic energy do we have here? Well, let's have a look. So this is option one. Kinetic energy now is, well, it's going to be a half times 3 kilograms times 10 squared. Let's see, a half times 3 is 1.5 and squares 100, 150 joules. Oh dear. We lost a lot of kinetic energy. We had 450, now we have 150. How is option two doing? Well, let's have a look. Uh, this one's at rest, so this one doesn't have any. This one is 2 kilograms, 15. So let's work this out. 1 half times 2 kilograms times 15 squared. And yes, I know I'm throwing the units here under the bus, but we know what those are. Um, half times 2 is 1. 15 squared is 225. Hmm, all right. We did better than, than we did up here. Lots more. In fact, we had pretty much exactly 50% of the original. Still, 50% of the kinetic energy apparently has just been been lost. Okay, now it gets interesting. Here we have two um, two objects moving, so we have to take them both into account for our total. I put one half times one times five squared. And that's this one. And I'm going to add to this plus one half times two times 12.5 squared. It's always a half mv squared. For, for each object, what does that come to? Or according to my math, I think it's 168.75 joules. So, you know, better than there, um, less than here, somewhere in the middle. But again, lots has been, has been lost. Hmm, what about this one here? Let's have a look. 10 and, and, and 20, so backwards. Okay, let's see what happens. Kinetic energy. It's going to be one half times the mass, one kilogram times 10 squared. I'm going to add to it the second one, one half times two times 20 squared. Um, this one here, so there's a couple of minus here, minus 10 squared, but the minus gets squared away anyway, right? So this is going to be a half times times 100, it's 50 plus 400. So this would actually be. Um, 450 joules. So in this case, oops, we do end up with the um, with the original. Now, interesting fact. Let's imagine though, I, this one was going back at like minus 20, right? So this one going back at 20 meters per second bounces back faster. And this would be going forward at 25. You can do the math to check that if this one's 20. Would have to be 25 momentum conservation. That would end, it would end up with more kinetic energy than 450, right? So momentum conservation allows for the kinetic energy to be created out of nothing. Well, it's not going to happen unless there's some kind of additional source, like it's an explosion, right? As they as they collide, right? Some explosive is being set off and they fly apart faster. Uh, let's not worry about that case. Let's worry about these cases where we where we lose a certain amount of um, kinetic energy. So this last case, where uh, out of the ones we considered, and there's lots more we could have considered, but this one appears to be special, right? This one is where the kinetic energy afterwards is exactly the same as the kinetic energy at the beginning. And it's only this one case. You can try any other numbers, any other you know velocities afterwards that conserve momentum in total. No other one is going to be 
exactly have exactly that kinetic energy. Right, so this is kind of some option four is, is some some kind of sweet spot, right? And this is the, the 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 collision that we call an elastic collision, where kinetic energy before and after is exactly the same. All those other ones is what we call inelastic collision. And you can sort of see why almost, right? This one they say stick together. There's nothing elastic about it. This one is a nice bounce back. Well, these ones are sort of in, in between. Um, so the terminology elastic collision is actually pretty good, right? If it sounds like it should be elastic, it's, it's bouncy in a way, then it is probably close to the, the formal definition of elastic collision, which is that the kinetic energy is conserved. But let's write that down. So here are some definitions. A collision is called elastic, I've underlined it, so this is the word we're defining here, if and only if the total kinetic energy is conserved. Little side note, if spelled with two Fs, it's a little bit of, sort of jargon that you might know well if you're a computer scientist, it means if and only if. It's a kind of convenient shorthand. What does if and only if mean? How is it different from if? Well, Total kinetic energy is conserved. Okay, so let's call it elastic. That's the if part. But if you have only if, that means if total energy is not conserved, that means you're not allowed to call it elastic. Right? So a collision is called elastic if the total kinetic energy is conserved, and in other cases too. No, only in the case that the total kinetic energy is conserved, and then for sure, if and only if, or in the little physics jargon or math jargon or computer science jargon if with two f's okay just a side note that's our definition then a collision is called inelastic if and only if it is not elastic sounds obvious but it's worth stating right so the formal definition of inelastic is just if it's not elastic it's called inelastic and if it's called elastic it's not called inelastic um, sounds trivial, but remember, open and closed sets are not opposites of each other. So there you go. Um, it's worth stating. And there's another definition, um, which is which we haven't talked about yet. A collision is called perfectly inelastic if and only if the maximally possible amount of kinetic energy is lost in this collision. Right. So a collision that is perfectly inelastic is necessarily inelastic because some amount of kinetic energy is lost. But what does it mean, the maximally possible? Like, why can't I just lose all of it? Well, all of it might not conserve momentum. And momentum always has to be conserved. So the understanding here is maximally possible amount. What does this mean? Um, with momentum still being conserved. Those are our definitions. Now, how can you tell? Well, maybe somebody just tells you, like a problem that you're solving tells you, hey, this is an elastic collision. Um, in real life, as I said before, generally the bounciness of something is a fairly good guide, right? So if you've got a you know bouncy ball, it hits a brick wall, it's probably fairly close to an elastic collision. Um, if a ball of mashed potato hits a door, it's probably not an elastic collision. You get the idea. Um, in practice, the perfectly inelastic case is one where the objects stick together. Um, that is not the definition of it, but in practice, that is what happens. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say this is this occurs when objects stick together, and if it tells you something is perfectly inelastic, you can you can assume that the objects are sticking together. Right. So. In practice, this is the most sort of useful um, property. Rather than trying to minimize the remaining kinetic energy, maybe using you know some kind of um, calculus to find the minimum of, um, of of the function of kinetic energy versus some other variable. Right, so in practice, just go with this. I made a little note here at the bottom. Um, 
In all those cases, momentum is conserved. So momentum is always conserved. Doesn't matter elastic, inelastic. Momentum is conserved because momentum just follows from Newton's first and sorry, Newton's second and third law. Right? Momentum is going to be conserved in all of those. But whether or not kinetic energy cons is conserved, but well, that is the questions question. That is where where those terminology this terminology comes in. Okay, let's look at an example. Here is the example that I want to solve. Imagine there's again some blob of mass, I don't care what it is. Two kilograms of it go 20 meters per second to the right. They hit head on another object that's four kilograms, it's going five meters per second to the left. And I want to know what happens in the two cases where A, this collision is elastic, and B, this collision is perfectly inelastic. Notice right, there's no part that says, the collision is inelastic because, well, if kinetic energy is lost, well, we still don't know how much is lost, right? Whereas in those two cases, those uniquely um, determine what's going to happen next. Let's see how this works out. So there are two, um, two quantities after the fact, right? After the crash, there's the first object, let's label it A, and let's label this one B. And I can ask how fast are they each going? So let me let me label the velocities before u a and u b. I want to use u, and I'm going to reserve the letter v for the velocities after. And it could be positive or negative, right? So u a, I'm going to use the letter u to mean velocity before the crash. V a, oops, it should be b of course. Excuse me. Um, and VA, VB for the velocity of each object after the crash. Right. So let's do part A. Well, momentum is conserved, so I have that MA, UA, that's the momentum of this one, plus MB, UB is equal to MA, VA, plus MB, VB, right? So momentum before plus momentum before of two objects, momentum after plus momentum after. All right. And of course I can actually plug in some some values here. So let me do this. So I have um, that two, let me write out two times twenty. I'm working in kilograms and meters per second. So I'm going to be lazy and not write down the units is 4 times minus 5. Why minus? Well, I, if I say this one's positive, that means I've said right is positive. Let me make a note, actually. Because, you know, somebody else might make a different choice. And then this would be negative and this positive. That's fine. Um, so what is this? It's 80 minus 20. So that is a 60 kilogram meters per second. So whatever else I'm getting, I'm getting at 60 kilograms meter per second is equal to on the right hand side, I've got two kilograms times VA plus four kilograms times VB. Those are my two unknowns. And notice I can't solve this because there are two unknowns, VA, VB, but I only got one equation. But I know the collision is elastic because we're doing part A, and that tells me that kinetic energy is conserved. So I can use this. So I'm going to write down one half m a u a squared plus one half m b u b squared. That's equal to one half m a v a squared plus um, one half m b v b squared. Right. So momentum. First point. And kinetic energy is the second one. I'm going to label this. Of course, you should have labeled it anyway in your notes. Um, but in case you don't, unless I do it myself, well, now I'm doing it. Okay, we can plug in some values. We can cancel out the halves, right, because they occur in every term. And then this is 2 kilograms, so I've got 2 ua squared plus 4 u b squared is equal to 2 um, v a squared p 
plus oops i can plug in values what am i doing even excuse me i want to of course plug in all the values not just the the masses i know the initial velocities it's 20 and, and minus 5 so um, i've got 2 times 20 squared and that's 800 plus 4 times 5 squared that's 100 and that's equal to 2ba squared plus 4ab squared. And so I've got 900 on the left, right? 900 joules or kilogram meter squared per second squared. It's equal to 2va squared and 2vb squared. So now we can solve it. I've got this equation here. And I've got this equation here, let me write like this, 900. Um, maybe we can actually simplify this a little bit. 450 joules is VA squared plus 2VB squared. Um, let me use this one instead of the other one. Right, so let me label those. This is equation 1. This is equation 2. And now I've got two equations and two unknowns, and it's fairly straightforward to solve them. Of course, this one I could have simplified a little bit more, actually. I could have written this as 30 is, you know, VA plus 2VB. So let's, let me write those out and walk you through the algebra. So my equation 1 becomes 30 is equal to VA plus 2VB. And I also have that 450 is VA squared plus 2vb squared. Now in this type of situation, depending on the exact numbers, there might be tricks to solve this, to do it fast, but I don't see one right here, so I'm just going to do it systematically. I'm going to take equation number 1, and I'm going to rearrange it. I'm going to write va is 30 minus 2vb, and then I'm going to plug this into, into the other equation to eliminate VA from it, and so I get 450 is equal to 30 minus 2VB squared plus 2VB squared, and here we go, I simplify this, 450 is 900 minus, let's get this right, um, 120VB plus 4VB um, squared, plus those two VB squared. Whew. Okay, let's write it in the sort of standard form of a quadratic. This is 0. It's going to be equal to 6VB squared minus 120VB um, plus 450, because 900 minus 450 is 450. Now I have a quadratic that I can solve just the usual way of using the quadratic equation. So I'm just going to simplify it a little bit more by dividing through by 6. So I'm going to get v, b squared minus 20vb plus, what's this, 75. Okay, and now I actually have to sit down and solve it. Now, I mean, at this point, you'd be welcome to, to you know, plug this into your quadratic, quadratic equation, but why not hone our algebra skills a little bit? Come on, we can do this. Does this factorize nicely? Of course, you will do this systematically, but I think you just use your, your mathematical, your arithmetical intuition a bit, and it turns out that this actually seems to work rather well. Well, vb squared, vb squared, vb minus 15, VB minus 5 is minus 20. 5 times 15, 75. It works out rather nicely. Um, so we get two solutions. VB is either equal to 5 meters per second or VB is equal to 15 meters per second. So I just paused my recording because I noticed there was a mistake. And if you caught that mistake earlier, good on you. It took me a second actually to, to find it. Um, 
And you can think about how I know that that, that can't quite be right. And maybe you want to come back to that question um, after you've, you've studied some other examples. But let's go back. I made a mistake somewhere high up. A very silly mistake. We all do them. I made it right at the beginning. 2 times 20 plus 4 times minus 5. 2 times, I think I said like 80 minus 20 is 60. Well, 2 times 20 isn't 80. It's 40. So this one here should not have said 60. This one here should have said 20. 40 minus 20 is 20. Mm, okay, not good, is it? Okay, well, this one I think is correct. But if this one there is 20, let's see if we can fix it. Notice that it helps how I laid out my work in such a way that I can easily keep track of what is what, right? This is my momentum conservation. I labeled equation 1, so I now have to come back here. So I took this equation and divided everything by 2. So this is not 30, this is going to be 10. Uh, this is 10, that means this one here is 10 as well. So this one here, so notice how easy it is for me to just fix it because I didn't have a giant heap of algebra. Uh, I just very clearly structured my calculation. Okay, well now we can change this one around. Um, this turns out to be 30. So I 10 squared is 100. And then this is not minus 120. But just minus um, minus two times ten, but times two because of the evaluating the, the ten minus two v squared. Um, this should be forty, and then this is correct. Uh, so now I let's simplify this. So maybe I should just cross out those last couple of lines. Um, and just rework those, just so I don't get confused. Happens to the best of us. So let me go back to this line here, 450. Um, so I'm going to get 0 is equal to, I'm going to take this other side, 6VB squared minus 40VB, and then 100 minus 450 comes to minus 350 and this now is the equation that I'm actually trying to solve. Well I can still simplify this a little bit, not quite as nicely, but I can just divide everything by 2. Oops, no, almost not a silly mistake, right? 6 divided by 2. And now this is the quadratic equation that I'm that I'm trying to solve. Now in this case again you'd be sort of excused to use the quadratic equation, but hey, we can do this, right? Now I'm just going to do it by sort of inspection. Right? I'm if we're going to look something like this, plus or minus, plus or minus, where I want this times this plus this times the unknown here become minus twenty, and then this times this to be minus one seventy five. Right, we can do this without a calculator. I think what I'm going to get um, is if I put minus 35 here and plus 5 here, then this times this is this, minus 35 times this, plus 5 times this becomes this, and then minus 35 times 5, okay, that's this. That works out, and so I can see that my answers are going to be either minus 5 meters per second or um, 35 over 3. And it's 11 um, and 2 thirds. And again, if you use a quadratic equation here, then that's fine. However, actually, there's a trick to actually how I solved this. Um, and this is, I anticipated this result. I'll tell you why in just a second. So let's write this down again, because we're not done yet. So we have VB is minus 5 meters per second, or VB is 35 over 3 meters per second. So both the you know, math says, both them are just fine. Now for each of them, I can figure out what the other velocity is. So VA, right, was 10. Um, 10 is equal to VA plus 2 VB. Let's figure out in each of those cases what VA would be. I want to hold it like, actually I want to have it like this because I know the result of all the calculation is now covered up. So if 
VB is minus 5, then if I plug minus 5 in here, then this would imply that VA is equal to um, is equal to 20 meters per second because minus 2 times minus 5 is minus 10 plus what makes plus 10 or 20. Um, whereas in this case, I get, ooh, this is a bit harder. Um, I, what will I find? I think, so 2 times 35 over 3 is 70 over 3. This is 30 over 3, so this would be minus 40 over 3. Okay, so I've got two possibilities, right? Either it's like this, or it's like this. Now, what do you notice about this thing? Hmm, I mean, it does, you can double check that each of them satisfies momentum conservation and satisfies kinetic energy conservation. But, hey, look at those numbers. They're exactly our starting values. Plus 20 for A, minus 5 for B. So, in this case, it's like they haven't collided at all. They just like pass through each other and continue just as they were. Now, obviously, if they don't actually crash, that's going to conserve kinetic energy and momentum because nothing's happened. Right? And the math says, hey, look, this is a possibility. Well, yes, it is. Thank you, math. But we kind of knew that. Kind of knew that if they don't crash, well, momentum and kinetic energy is conserved. So, trivial. So, this is our trivial solution. This is our actual a crash has occurred interesting solution. So I'm get rid of this now too. Right, so this is trivial. Um, no actual crash. Whereas this one is the, the relevant one. Notice that for this one, VB it was coming from the right to the left, and VA coming from the left to the right. They'd have to pass through each other. It's another way to say, hey, this is not the right solution, not the one I want, because the, the two solid objects, they can't pass through each other. But even if they were like clouds of gas, right, they hit an interstellar space, um, so what? This is still the boring solution where they don't interact at all. So this is my, my relevant solution. You want to double check that indeed those, those values are going to satisfy kinetic and momentum energy conservation. Um, there was a part B to our problem. And I can guarantee you part B is going to be a lot simpler. In part B, we had the perfectly inelastic um, collision. Now, if you find, um, find my question statement again, here it is, right, part B. What if the same collision is perfectly inelastic? Well, if it's perfectly inelastic, then we know that the two, two objects are going to stick together. So that's what we're going to use. So in that case, we're just going to use momentum conservation. And momentum conservation was that um, M A U A plus M B U B. So the initial momenta added up is equal to. Well, now I can write it like this. I can add up the masses and multiply by just one final velocity. Because steady stick together, so the same final velocity. So this is much easier to solve. In fact, I solved this one before. Let's just go through it. So here, left hand side I solved before. We had um, two kilograms times 20 meters per second plus four kilograms times minus five meters per second um, is equal to sum them up six kilograms times V unknown b okay this is easy now the left hand side this is not 80 right yes i learned it the hard way um 20 kilogram meters per second is equal to six kilogram times times what times v v is equal to 20 over six meters per second or 10 over three um, so that's like 3.33 meters per second and that's it much nicer much shorter in this case, much easier. Um, but the technique of solving part A, that was long, which combining the equation, solving the quadratic, uh, that is something you want to have up your sleeve when you tackle those kinds of problems. Okay, so here's another example that I want to study in some detail. 
I imagine there's a card here and it's stationary and I put another card of mass M that I'm going to crash into that card. And I'm going to assume that collision is elastic, right? If it's not, okay, different example, you know, what we talk about now doesn't apply. But I want to consider what happens if I do this, I crash this card into that one um, elastically. Now, I imagine this card here, it might have the same mass, m, but it might have multiple ones. So here I drew it like it is like six blocks, it's six times the mass of this. But maybe I can stack up like a hundred of them, so it's a hundred times the mass. Now here's what you observe if you do that. Say we do this experiment, we do it a hundred times, and every time we add more mass to this card here. Well, if it's one mass, one mass, equal masses, this one's going to hit it, stop, and the second one's going to go off. Should be fairly at the, at the same speed that this one was coming in at. As so this one goes in, it's almost like they sort of hand over the duty of going, bumps it, this one takes over, goes the same speed, if they're the same mass. That's what you would observe if you actually do this experimentally. Now, if you keep stacking up more mass, though, what's going to happen is that this one starts bouncing back, and this one starts moving forward. And if you measure the velocity of this one, you'll find that the bounce back keeps getting faster and faster and faster the more mass you stack on here. But it, it sort of approaches the initial initial incoming speed, but backwards. So if I stack 10,000 masses here, essentially make this into a brick wall, this one's going to bounce back with pretty much the same speed it had coming in. Right, so one mass hits one mass, this mass stops, this one goes. It is the same, same as the incoming speed. Stack up masses, well, this one starts, the incoming one starts bouncing back, and this one goes forward, but well, the incoming one bounces back, and the more I stack up, the more the incoming, the, the bounce back speed of this card here, when it goes backwards, approaches the same speed it had coming in. And if this is, the, you know, 100,000 masses, 100,000 times the mass of this one, essentially it's an unmovable wall or nigh unmovable, well, then this one's just going to bounce back with effectively the same speed that it had coming in. And I want to prove that, right? So that's the, that's the experimental observation that we could do. Uh, but we want to prove that now. So let's prove it by doing the obvious thing. Momentum and kinetic energy conservation, right? It's elastic, so we know, we're told it's elastic, so we know kinetic energy is conserved. So momentum means what? Well, initially it's mass times u is equal to, now I'm going to call this card 1 and this card 2, and card 2 has, the mass of card 2 is n times the mass of card 1, right? So Afterwards, I have m times v1. I'm going to call the outgoing velocities v1 and v2. I'm going to add to it the mass of the, the second card. It's n times m, right? That's its mass, times the unknown velocity of that card. So v1, v2. Again, I'm going to use those for the velocity after the collision of each of those two, two cards. And of course, this one has no initial velocity, it's just stationary. So there's only one term on the side, there's only one u. Then, actually, before I go anywhere, let me simplify this. I can cancel out the m. You can imagine it's like one kilogram each. So one kilogram and one, two, three, four, five, six kilograms right now. u is v1 plus n v2. And that's going to be one of the equations we're going to use. You can then look at kinetic energy, and kinetic energy says one half m u squared is one half m v one squared plus one half the mass of the, the loaded up card n times m, you know, six times n six in the picture, v two squared. Um, I can simplify this two a little bit and cancel out the halves, right, and the m's again, and so I'm going to end with u squared is v one squared plus n times v2 squared. So those two equations, they look almost the same, except this one has squares and all the velocities. Okay, now we just have to solve this, right? And uh, this is going to be a general solution for any n. If you decide how many masses you want to stack up, well, we're going to work all of those possibilities at the same time by leaving n general.
Now here's how I'm going to do this, and again there are different ways to algebraically approach this, but if I call this number, oops, I should use 1 and 2, those are our, our cards, um, let me call this this equation, equation A and this equation B. Now I'm just going to t take equation A and I want to square it. So I get u squared is v1 squared plus 2nv1 v2 plus n squared v2 squared. Right, so I just square this side equals square of this side. Notice that gives me a cross term in the middle as well. Again, with any kind of algebra we do, pause the video if you're not entirely sure to make sure you could follow the steps again yourself. Why did I do that? Because then this left hand side is equal to the, the left hand side of B, right? So this one is equal to, to equation B, u squared, u squared. So that means I can eliminate u. I can write it v1 squared plus 2n v1 v2 plus n squared v2 squared. This thing here is equal to this thing here v1 squared plus n v2 squared. I can simplify this a little bit. Notice I eliminated u. Eliminate those. And actually I can also cancel out a factor of n, right? Because it's this n, that's n squared. So I'm just going to make the square go away and here. And so I am left with, let's not get confused, 2v1, v2. Actually, I could also, I should have done this right away, cancel out the v2, v2, v2. So I have 2v1 is equal to nv2, sorry, plus, now I'm confusing u, plus nv2 is equal to um, just v2. All right. So again, make sure you follow the algebra, a lot of cancellations here. So I can then write v 2v1, I'm just doing algebra right now, it's going to be v2 times 1 minus n, because I'm taking this term to the other side, and then I'm factorizing it. And so I can write v1, as actually I want v2, v2 is um, 2 divided by 1 minus n v1. All right, so I've got v2 in terms of v1. Actually, I'm just going to rewrite a little bit more. n is going to be bigger than 1 for the most part. You know, I keep stacking up masses. It's 1, 2, 3, 10, 100. So just because I like, I kind of, want this denominator to be positive for no particular reason except it makes me more comfortable. I'm going to write it like this. I'm going to take the minus side out the front. So it makes the denominator um, positive as long as n is bigger than bigger than 1, which we assume it is. Oops, and I made a mistake. Uh, this one is, of course, um, v... Now I'm confusing myself. Um, this one is, of course, v v1. Okay, so I've expressed v2 in terms of v1. Now actually, I don't really care so much about the v2, how quickly is this card moving after the collision. But the reason I did this is because now I'm going to take this expression and I'm going to plug it back into here, right? So take this, let me call this number 3 or c, using letters for equations right now. I want to plug C back into A to eliminate V2. Let me write this down so I want to annotate what I'm doing. Because what that gives me is that it gives me um, a relationship between the incoming velocity and the bounce back velocity or the, the velocity of the smaller card after the collision. So let me do that. I'm going to get u is v1 a, right? I'm going to add n times v2, but for v2, I want to plug in what I had here. And so what that makes is, let me write it out carefully, plus n, then I multiply it by minus 2 over n minus 1 
v1. Okay. So I guess you can just simplify this a little bit. u is v1, right, 1. And then multiplying this here is going to be minus 2n over n minus 1. And once again, you know, if, if the algebra seems a bit confusing, post the video right here. Go from this line to this line. Maybe for the line in the middle, in between, it's fine. But make sure you can follow each step because, you know, you should have that kind of algebra at your fingertips. I'm going to simplify this a little bit more, I think. I want to call this v1 and I'm going to put it all over n minus 1. And so I get n minus 1 minus 2n. And then I can finally write this as um, minus n plus 1 over n minus 1, right? n minus 2n is minus n, minus 1 minus n, we're going to take the minus sign out front. Of course, let's not forget the v1. Right? It's just algebra. Um, okay, well, actually, I want it the other way around because I want the bounce back, the, the velocity of cart, um, the, the incoming cart in terms of the incoming speed, the incoming velocity. I want this as um, it's going to be minus n minus 1 n plus n plus 1 times u. Right. So let's annotate this just so we don't forget what this all means. Velocity of cart 1 after the collision. And that's the incoming speed of card one. So it's kind of how what's how fast it's going afterwards compared to, to incoming. Now there's a minus sign here. That means we're going to go backwards. We're bouncing. Okay, now let's look at this expression here. Here you can now see quite nicely um, what happens. So now you can give me an n, say 6, right? 6 blocks, okay? Well, I want to plug in 6 for n and I get 5 over 7. So the bounce back speed would be 5 seventh of the incoming speed. You say, I want to only stack up 2, 2 blocks here, 2 stationary ones in this card. This one's coming in. All right, well, 2 minus 1 is 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3, so one-third. It bounces back with one-third of the speed it had coming in. But now what happens? If n becomes large, now large, what does large mean? A hundred, a thousand, a million? I don't care. Mathematically, I can imagine n becomes essentially infinity. Well, n minus 1 over n plus 1 becomes 1. It gets closer and closer to 1. Right? So let's try it. If I have n is 1, 2, 3, 4, 100, 1,000, right? What do I get um, for n minus 1 over n plus 1? What's this fraction? Well, it's going to be 0 because 0 over 2. Then I get 1 third. Then I get 2 fourths. Then I get Three fifths. I get ninety nine over one hundred one. Very close to one already. Nine 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 over one thousand and one. Extremely close to one. You can see how those numbers get closer and closer and closer and closer to one. So for large n, the bounce back speed is just minus one or very close to one times the incoming speed. For the bounce back, the, the velocity afterwards, right? It's minus because we're bouncing back, and then essentially 1 if n is sufficiently large. And that proves what you would have observed in the lab if you actually did that experiment. Okay, now here's the final example I want to look at for the purpose of this video. Imagine you're playing pool or billiards. You have two balls and they're identical. They're all mass m. Mass m, mass m doesn't matter what it is. I think a normal pool ball is something like, like just under 200 grams, something like that. I'm going to call them ball A, ball B, just so I can keep them apart. And here's what happened. 
happens. You do this. If you play pool, you might notice this. Now, I'm, I'm assuming this ball comes in, and let's assume it's not like spinning. It doesn't have any spin. Now, it's like spinning on its sort of axis in some, some funny way. That would change things, because we'd have to talk about angular momentum conservation. Uh, no, it's just a ball. It, it just rolls in. Bang. It hits this one. Now you can hit this one at different points, and if you hit it up here, then the, the B might go down. If you hit it straight on, A might stop, and B might go, like in the example we just had, if N um, is 1. But no matter how you hit it, as long as it doesn't come with some sort of sideways spin, you know, some kind of fancy shot, right, it just comes in, no matter where it hits this ball, you're going to find that the two balls are going to bounce off each other at some angles, and you're finding that the sum of those angles, so this total angle between the two directions that the balls are going in, is 90 degrees, or very close to it in practice. And our goal is to prove it, that that is indeed the case. And you get that result if the collision is elastic. So we're going to assume the collision is elastic. We're going to show why that leads to those two angles adding up to 90 degrees. Now there are two ways to do this first way. I'm not going to do that one because it's long and boring, so I'm going to tell you to do that in your own time at home. I'm going to do it component by component. You write down X momentum conservation. So I'm going to assume X is this direction, Y is this direction, kind of the, the most common choice here, um, and this is just coming in horizontally along the X axis. This gives me m times u is equal to, well, this has nothing, this adds nothing, momentum conservation here, m times vA cosine theta a, right, the horizontal component of this one, plus mVB cosine theta b, you can cancel out the m's. The y momentum conservation. Well, initially nothing's going up and down, so I can write zero, and then I can write, well, this one goes up, this one goes down, so mVA sine theta a minus mVB sine theta b. Why minus? Because b is going down, and I nonetheless define this angle as positive. So again, you can um, you can cancel the m, simplify it a little bit, but in addition you have kinetic energy conservation, and that tells you that, well I should write out for one half m u squared is one half m v a squared plus one half m v b squared, and here you can cancel out the half and the m. And you have those three equations, maybe simplified a little bit, and then you want to simplify them and somehow get a result of the angle. Now the way to do this, I'm just going to outline it for you, is you square the x momentum and the y momentum equation. Let me label those equations 1, 2, and 3. Square 1 and 2. So each of those equations you square, plug it into, into 3 simplify and simplifying here is going to involve the fact that cosine squared plus sine squared for any angle is equal to 1 but not enough you don't want to use you're still going to get a, you're left over with something 0 equals something complicated looking but you can simplify using a trig identity namely one that, that it says cosine alpha plus beta. What is that? You can look that up. You know about trig identities. So use that in your simplification. And all that said and done, you'll be left with cosine theta 1 plus theta 2 being equal to 0, which tells you that theta 1 plus theta 2 is equal to 90 degrees. Now I think it's very valuable to go through those steps. Actually do it. Take each of those, square it, like simplify it, square it, plug it into 3, simplify that, use this 
trick identity and another trick identity for how do you express this. Look this up yourself. You know how to do it. We've talked about it before. It's part of your mathematical toolbox. Go through the steps. You're going to end up with this result, which proves that theta 1 plus theta 2 is equal to 90, because the cosine of 90 is 0. Fair enough. You can do it this way. Takes a while. You'll get there. You learn something in the process. Let me do it the other way. The other way is a lot faster. The fast way. The first way, and there's the fast way. Now the fast way relies on the dot product um, for vectors, right? We're going to use the fact that if I've got two vectors a and b, that's equal to the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the cosine of the angle between them. Let's call it phi, right? So I've got a vector a and a vector b, and this is phi. Then this is one way to express the, the dot product. Okay. So let's write down energy and momentum conservation. Energy conservation says this. Sorry, con uh, momentum conservation says this. mu, and write as a vector, um, is m v a plus m v b. So I'm having, instead of writing it as components, I just write it as a vector equation. Momentum is conserved as a vector. I can, of course, just simplify it, cutting out the m's, right? Cancels out. Energy conservation says one half m u squared is one half m v a squared plus one half m v b squared. Again, I can simplify this half m, half m, half m. So u is a v a plus v b as vectors, important, not speeds, as vectors. Uh, but u squared, the speed squared, is vA squared plus vB squared. Maybe we should write it out again, just so that it doesn't look so messy. Right. And u squared is vA squared plus vB squared. Hmm. Now here's the trick. Here, here's the trick I, ca I can use now. I'm going to take the dot product of u with itself. So both a and b in this general equation are now u. So u dot u is va plus vb dotted with va plus vb. Now you might have to, how comfortable you are with this depending on how much vector you've done. One strange thing about the American education system is that in many places, math courses don't address the dot product or vectors even until some kind of calculus course. I don't get it. Like this is, this is stuff you can do without doing any calculus, without knowing anything about, you know, derivatives or integrals. This is just some vector operation that you can solve algebraically, a bit of geometry, a bit of algebra. So I don't know why in the American system this this type of thing, the dot product and vectors, remain mysterious until so late to, to the student. Like It makes no sense to me. It is total nonsense. If you're lucky enough to come from a country with a decent education system, um, especially in math, well, then you probably meet, you know, dot products and vectors way before, long before you meet any form of calculus. Anyway. So... If this makes sense to you, great. If it doesn't, remember you always have the, the other method with the um, with the, the the component by component way. Let's keep going with this one though. So this means the left hand side is u squared because it's it's. Let me write it out actually. Um, well, the the angle between a vector and itself is zero, so it's u times u times cosine of zero, which is one u squared is now, dot product, I can distribute like anything else, any other type of multiplication, so the base distribution laws, get VA squared plus VA dot VB. Now, VA dot VB is the same as VB dot VA, so I can just do it like this, plus VB squared. Right, again, I got from here to here by this dot this, plus this dot this, plus this dot this, plus this dot this. 
and then using commutativity that VA dot VB is equal to VB dot VA. It gets me here. Again, pause the video, do it yourself. Okay, but, but now, so this was arrived from momentum conservation, right? But I have this one here. Let me write out again. Right, so I have this is equal to this plus this. Well, that means this thing here has to be zero. All right, so, okay, the two is not zero, so VA dot VB is zero. Hmm, okay, well, what is it equal to? We're gonna use the stuff that I wrote down just as above. It's the two magnitudes times the angle between them. Well, that means either one of them is zero, so one ball might stop, right? And that's possible. Right? One possibility is this one comes in and stops, and this one goes off. That's possible. In this case, VA would be zero. It could be that VB is zero. I think that just means you missed. Right? If this one is zero, like afterwards, it means you, you just missed. It didn't hit it. Okay, let's assume neither one of them is zero. That means the cosine of the angle is zero. So that means, so if VA isn't zero, so the speed of ball A isn't zero, and the speed of ball B, oops, not zero, speed of ball B isn't zero, then cosine of the angle between them is zero. The angle, of course, between A and B, right, is the thing I might call phi, theta A plus theta B. Well, if the cosine of an angle is zero, it implies the angle itself is going to be 90. I'm going to write it up here. Phi is equal to 90 degrees. There. And that's what I wanted to show, that the angle between the two vectors, between two velocity vectors, is 90. Much faster than going it going this way. So very powerful, this dot product, and being able to manipulate vectors directly rather than having to go through components. So I suggest you practice that, especially if you've seen vectors before in the dot product, but you've never really had to use it for much, except in a math course and um, for some abstract calculation. Doesn't matter, here you go. Really powerful result. Why do you, how to play pool um, with vectors? Even then though, even if this makes sense to you, good exercise to just check through this method as well. And you can show that they're essentially equivalent. Thanks for watching. Thanks for sticking with me to the end of this very long video. Um, that concludes it for energy. And I'll see you in the next lecture in which we're going to start a new topic.